the sexualization of pride seeks to help the most confident and the most accepted members of the community and does so to the detriment of those who are not. And we think just for that reason alone, it is regrettable. In terms of setup, we think the kinds of things we are regretting at Pride events are things like nudity, exceedingly ex revealing outfits that people are wearing, ex explicitly sexual floats like the furries or the leather daddies <laughs> ones that are constantly recurring and, and happening in greater numbers. We are not forgetting things like the party elements of it, although perhaps those change in some ways. Like you don't play s and by Rihanna, but you do play Dancing Queen by Abba instead, and there are equal elements of gay culture that are separate to that. But, I mean, the likely counterfactual to that are things like a triumphing of love in that instance, which we think is likely the most other counterfactual, because it is the clearest other element of the queer experience, like it's kind of sex and love, and we think if you don't have sex, you likely try and bring love in those clothes, which are things like showing queer couples, things like showing in people doing their experiences of pride, and still a celebration of queerness without the rampant sexualization that has happened recently. So, two points in this speech. The first was on individual queer people and how sexualization impacts them. The second is on the effectiveness of pride as a movement. So, the first thing to note on this first issue is that they, there is a particularly exclusive form of sexuality that is trying by there, and the people who are most willing or the most able to take their clothes off at Pride are white twinks, overwhelmingly. But that is, and that is inherent, and not just, you know, my experiences of Pride, because, <laughs> as a white twink myself, um, because, and that's for inherent reasons, like, the people who are most comfortable in that community are likely to do so, and, the, and you know, the, the ways in which people have been accepted over time is predominance towards a certain kind of person, and maybe that is mirrored in other elements of queerness, like, you know, there is no perfect representation of the queer community in, that, in, in terms of like marriage or love instead, but it is likely worst in terms of sex because it compounds with other societal factors and the ways in which people are perceived in certain acceptable forms of sexuality or things like beauty norms and the way that you're allowed to look hot in certain ways, or you have to be tan or you have to be tall and you know, the ways in which you're appearing. There are likely worse ones, like you know, you have to be white. Um, I think that's the kinds of ways in which those, those are predominantly done, right? But secondly, and the importance of that argument is that it's, to the extent that this is a useful force for some people to express in sexuality, that it is a benefit that applies to a very small number of people because it is certainly an exclusive form of celebration of sexuality that's purported. Second argument here is that it creates a coercive pressure among people, particularly younger people are tried to be sexual as part of that queer identity. And this conflation of queerness with sexuality that is most purported by people jumping on, on, on floats or being essentially naked in their flakes or hooking up on floats that tells people that to be queer is to be sexual. And particularly for people who are younger, who are attending Pride at 15 or 16 and coming to terms with their sexuality, the dominant narrative sold to you by Pride is that you have to be sexual, which is particularly harmful. Either if you act upon those beliefs and, and force yourself into sexual experiences you are not comfortable with or you do not feel entirely safe in doing because you feel like in order to validate your identity it has to be sexual and are likely to force yourself above where you are comfortable for the reasons that this is a kind of, you know, uh, almost a satire of sexualization that is provided at Pride. It's not good depictions uh, in, in where that sex is done. Or you do not, in which case you feel shame and feel like you are not fulfilling that queer stereotype. You feel like you have some kind of emotion that is not being validated and you are not doing queerness right, which is a fear that people at, in the early stages of their lives have. And when the dominant narrative is sold to you by people who are confident in that movement, who are older, who are who is sure in what they're doing, is showing a sexualization of that. That is why it is worse for the, the people who are pressured into pride by the way in which the dominant narrative is sold. But thirdly, we think there are far other, more more important ways to legitimize and validate and carve out spaces for queer sexuality to the extent that it's an important thing to do because the most important thing for you know the way that people who are queer and have early sexual experiences and not by seeing those validated by naked people on pride flows it is by talking to their friends about the first dude that they've kissed which is the way in which that validated and that is not only a better form but it is one that in some ways pushed out by this that you feel like you have to be sexual to the greatest degree because you always know someone else who is a pride and being much more sexual than you who is being more naked and those are ways in which you feel like your small victories as a queer person are shoved to the side and what I uh, and, and that is obviously harmful for people who are most vulnerable. So under this issue, perhaps there are some people who are helped by this. Perhaps there are some who you know thrive and live in a sexy lifestyle at Pride, but those people are those who are already most comfortable, who are most established, who are most confident in what they are doing and need the help of the Pride movement and the queer movement the least. Those who are not are those who are isolated by it, who are told they have to be sexual and shame them when they are not, and that is the harm of the sexualization of Pride for 
individual people. Second issue point in this speech on the effectiveness of pride as a movement. And the first thing to note here is that the way in which sex, and, and especially in recent years, is occurring in these movements is to overshadow the far more queer elements of that because there is a kind of shock factor in the kinds of folks that are being displayed on things like Mardi Gras means that there is more discussion about furry sexualities or leather daddies or BDSM which are not queer in the way that other queer expressions are and they are more important to be showcased and the fact that they are that you cannot show queer love as explicitly and as graphically and as interestingly to people is a harm because it pushes out the more important aspects of that queer movement and in an ironic way thus the sexualization of pride is de-queerifying it in a way that is particularly harmful for people that is the first reason it hurts the effectiveness of pride as a movement but secondly it legitimizes particularly harmful narratives because obviously it is not just queer people or queer allies who see pride events and see things like the Sydney Mardi Gras being shown it is all society and we have to consider the ways in which those are then reported and, and, and perceived and interpreted by other people and it is to sell and justify and legitimize narratives of ickiness, of difference, of saying that it is perverted in the way that those are happening, particularly for people who are living in conservative or religious communities who are far less you know, applicable to letting their kids go to those in the first place, or when someone comes out, the instant, you know, the, because it's the most showy element of it, the ways in which those are perceived are the ones that make you least likely to be willing to accept that. And this is not us, you know, standing for like an assimilation narrative in, in, in queerness, in the same that other elements of queerness have to be emphasized in a way that is somewhat strategic. That everyone understands love and there is no way to make it more or less in love, or at least if there is, they're not as harmful as the ways in which sex are. Encouraging you to love someone more is perhaps good. But, and we need to be careful in the ways we are emphasizing those, and now it is which everyone can understand and that are not, you know, attacked by religion, that are less able to be attacked by conservative parents who have worried for their kids and feel like they're becoming sexual deviants are most important in order, to have, in, in order to bring people on side. And even if those are not people who we're perfectly able to convince in either world, we are at least not shoving them away in the way in which sexualization of pride does. Thirdly, to the extent that um, you know, there is a need for representation of sex in, in the queer movement and in pride, this is a particularly poor medium of doing so for the reasons that they did previously. That it allows a particular dominant narrative of sexualization to be reported, that it is isolating for others, and that it is radicalized to like the nth degree of sexiness, which means it is a poor way of representing the, you know, the sex elements of the queer experience, because no one has like really has sex covered in glitter and in tiny like sequin underpants. <laughs> that is not a realistic experience, but it is one that is told to people who are unconfident in the sexualities. Fourthly and finally, this lessens the activist elements of the of pride movement because it means that politicians or powerful people are far less able to do things like encourage participation, attend these events, justify the narrative of messages that are being sold to them because there are, is such backlash to the sex elements of it that are happening, which means that in order to bring around powerful allies who are most able to do meaningful and real change for the queer community are put apart and less able to politically be seen to legitimize and justify pride movements, which is their very purpose. The purpose of Pride is not to make white twins feel sexier, it is to help people who are marginalised and allow people to feel confident and sexualization does not help. Fashion propose. For a speech where within its dying seconds tried to say it was going to make this a protest, to tell us in this debate that gay people should keep making the trade-offs they have been forced against their will to make for decades and decades in order to make themselves more palatable to conservatives, less icky, less perverse, in order to make those people like them more, was always going to lose them this debate. I'm going to do a couple of things. Firstly, I'm going to look at uh, how this diversifies the, the queer movement. Then I'm going to look at how it impacts, actually there, there's mostly just misc there. But then I'm also going to look at women, which were entirely ignored surprisingly by that first speaker. Firstly, why is it not true that this becomes solely focused around twins? Because that is the premise on which they hang the rest of their speech. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, some of their own examples undermine this because the time when you're most likely to just get a focus on white twins being the only people who are hot is in places like ARC, where there are like crowds that go every week that are very difficult to break into if you do not look exactly like them. It's places like Grindr, where you don't even get a look in because people's profiles have no Asians on them. The only other places you're currently afforded within the queer community to engage in this do not facilitate that at all. But also, 
the bodies that have been desexualized in general in the queer movement are the ones that are often given primacy at queer events. That looks like things like the leather daddies, which Thomas wanted to act with, like hairless twins. They're hairy, they're overweight, and they are old, and they are sexy in Mardi Gras. That is so rare and so difficult. And it was hard to see how they could use that example and then say Mardi Gras is this exclusive thing that never had diverse representations of people. It has things like representations of, of like an Indian group called the Fog Gay Float, which sexualizes queer men of color in a way that they otherwise never will be under their side of the house. It looks like having the sister girls fly in from the Northern Territory and the Tiwi Islands and be able to be sexualized as indigenous trans women. That will never happen at ARC. That will never happen on Grindr. And they want to say they should trade it off for Rainbow Valentine's Day. It was never good enough in this debate to say those people didn't deserve to have their sexuality. It was never good enough in this debate to say uh, that they weren't going to be there. Ah, so how does this affect the way queer men perceive of themselves and in society? We think one of the last barriers that need to be overcome for queer men in this debate is that people perceive of their sex as something which is perverse and icky, as they conceive at first affirmative. They say we should make pride more palatable so that people will be more likely to go along with this. But that ignores the power that pride can have, because it was untrue in this debate that it works the way they wanted to say. It isn't that politicians and prominent people opt out of cry because it's sexualized. It looks like photos that we now have of Malcolm Turnbull walking up to naked twins rolled in glitter and shaking their hand. It looks like pulling conservative politicians into sexualized gay sex parades. That is absolutely insane. The fact that we've been able to do that is phenomenal and it is where pride gets its power as a protest from. Because Thomas is right, we don't really need to protest for love is love anymore. It's been accepted. We're okay with gay people getting married. We're okay with them moving in next door and adopting a cute child. What we're not okay with is the fact that we think their sex is perverse. Thomas concedes that that is our final frontier when he says that that is the one thing we can't tackle. But pride is a unique vector by which we have done just that. So what do they say? They want to say that we should focus on love instead. It's unclear why that's necessary or even what that looks like. Is that just a parade of people holding hands and listening to ABBA? Because if so, I'm not sure that's subversive. And if they want to say that pride should be a protest, which is functionally where it gets a lot of its value from in this debate, it should protest people something, thing, something that people are angry about. Furthermore, the reason why this has been chosen over time as something we should protest through this particular vector is because it has been uniquely taken away from the community in two ways. First, that community has been tricked to do it to themselves by the kinds of rhetoric that Thomas wanted to talk about at first, which is that you should make yourself palatable to conservatives so that they will give you your basic human rights, which has meant queer people have internalized and enforced on themselves and their own communities the idea that we should be just like you and leave white picket fence desexualized lives. The second and important thing to note here is gay sex has been criminalized. You cannot police or criminalize having affection. You can and people have criminalized and thrown people into prison for having gay sex. This is a powerful stance against the state which took that away to pull the leader of that state into Mardi Gras and reclaim that sexuality. And they say that this will lead to the belief that to be gay is to be sexual, but it ignores the context in which the sexualization of pride happened, where it moved from a protest against like police discrimination into a protest about the fact that they weren't able to embrace that particular part of their identity at all. This is a counter narrative to wider societal narratives that tell you you shouldn't be sexual, that is disgusting. It's older people in your community telling you it is okay to have this as a facet of your identity. If you're at the age where you're considering going to mind bra alone, you're probably at the age where everyone else at your school is also talking about sex. They're also starting to watch porn, they're also starting to experiment sexually, but for you, you have to go into kink sites or you think that it's perverse that you're doing this. Thomas admits that it, people see it as icky. The fact that you can tell teenagers that this is a normal thing to do, this is celebrated, politicians will come, Westpac will throw out dick straws, is absolutely insane. And it is the unique victory of pride, which makes it something that doesn't seem like an inconvenience when it shuts down the entire city. It makes it seem like a party. 
up. Next thing I'm going to do in this speech is talk about how this has affected queer women, which was entirely missing from the first affirmative speech in this debate, even though they are half the queer community. There are two ways in which queer women's sexual identity is taken away from them. Both of them stem from the idea of non-mutuality. That is to say, people desexualize interactions that happen between women in terms of how they could be mutual, which means we say that women don't have sexual desire in general, therefore how does sex between two women even work? People question the logistics of sex between two women, and yet from the standpoint of the man, they see it as a performance for their own benefit, they see it as something which belongs to them and something which they have claimed. For decades, queer women's sexuality has been taken from them. Cities are unwilling to provide infrastructure for them to enact that sexuality in any way. That is to say, in Sydney, there is one bar for queer women on a Wednesday night in Enmore. This is literally the one day of the year where you are able to openly talk about your sexuality and celebrate your sexuality and reclaim it from people who have said that it exists only for the male gaze and only for men to look at. I'll note in this debate that this is the literal only way that, so that societies have been able to facilitate this happening for women. And the kinds of ways that it happens for women was entirely missing from the first affirmative speech. It looks like showing dykes on bikes hooking up with women in glitter boobs. It looks like having entire floats which are dedicated to sexualized representations of women that are distinct from the male gaze because they are enacted in a place where the only men surrounding them are gay. That is powerful and it is the only option that can tell young queer women that it is possible for them to have sexually fulfilling lives, that it is possible for them to enact that sexuality and for it not to be something which is entirely missing, which is literally the only narrative that otherwise exists if you are a young queer woman in the world because you were told that that desire is only performed for men and could not possibly be your own. In this debate, this was a powerful reclamation of something that has otherwise been taken away, stamped with the power of Westpac and Malcolm Turnbull, proud to the gate. most about in the debate were people who are conservative or teenagers who are uncomfortable with their sexuality, then surely it's important to have public displays of gay sexuality if everything else in society tells you to repress it inside yourself. Like, I just don't understand why a parade that quashes all of that and says, that's dirty, keep that indoors, but you can hold hands and hold heart balloons if you want, was going to make someone feel like they had the guts to have anal sex with someone if they wanted to, or to know like how to navigate that situation or physically like how to hook up with someone like those things were things that you kind of only got used to when you visually saw them and yes people have porn i guess but some people's computers are monitored by their parents like seeing on the news malcolm turnbull that shake the hand of someone who has like a dildo in their other hand <laughs> makes people think like well if the prime minister doesn't think it's dirty and disgusting and he's the head of the conservative party maybe it's not so dirty and disgusting when Every other day of the year you are made to feel that it is because you're a teenager living in a conservative community. Those are the people that needed to see this and that's why we actually think we serve them in the debate. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of rebuttal and then basically just talk about why I think replacing it with love and emphasising love is more exclusionary and takes away a lot of the important benefits of Mardi Gras as an event. But firstly I want to talk about exposure to diversity because they said white, hot, tan twins who go to the gym all the time are, you know, told to be the only people who deserve acceptance because they're the ones that are lauded the most. We thought that the floats that were more diverse were things like the ones that Rachel talked about, but importantly, like things like porn or going to a club were situations where those types of people were much more rewarded. Whereas if you had an event where necessarily the size of your float dictates that you're equally included, you get just as much airtime, you travel the same space, means that you could see people who are like fairies and ladder daddies and like I didn't understand why necessarily they were less important or less oppressed. Like kinks were, I don't know, something people struggled with and that was like part of being queer to some extent and I just thought that like you didn't explain to us why weird kinks were like not important in the debate. I think they got exposure and I think that made people think of sexuality and being attractive in different ways. But the next thing they say is that it tells you that to be queer is to be 
sexual and it encourages people to force themselves into sex. I think these counteract social norms that are far stronger day to day that tell you that you should bury your sexual desire, that you should be ashamed of it, you should not tell anyone that you want to do dirty sexual things to someone else that you know. And, and for Shorty to say it is the dominant narrative to tell people that they have to have sex to be queer is actually a protest narrative because traditionally people have told to go to conversion camp or just don't tell anyone or marry a woman and just keep those thoughts inside yourself and don't engage in queer sex. I think it's important there's at least one night a year that tells people like, go out on the town and fuck someone up the ass if you want. I think that's great. That's a little bit different to what you hear every other day. And that's why we thought it was actually a protest narrative, not the dominant narrative. And the next thing they say is it lessens activism because politicians are less likely to go. At the point at which the two heads of the Liberal Party, which is the Conservative Party, go and get to meet Cher. Like, <laughs> and there's pictures of them with Cher and pictures of them with furries all over the internet. I think that's obviously not true. But if you keep something fun and exciting and sexy and a bit naughty, it's actually kind of easy to promote to people and get them to go because it's an exciting thing for them to do on the weekend. If it's just Valentine's Day as a parade, like that is far less persuasive and fun for people to go to. So I thought it was easier from an activist point of view to promote. And then Pacino sells up, tells us that the sexualization of events causes sexual racism and objectification. I think that's more likely caused by things that happen every day of the year. Things like, like literally just porn, dating apps, like advertising, anything else that is constant. The difference with the parade is that you actually show a diverse range of floats and show different types of loves, love and different types of sexual kinks and different types of conceiving your sexuality. The whole point of it was that you had to have hundreds of, of different floats that were all different. That probably meant that it was more diverse than your average day and we would happily protect that. Pacino then says, well, everyone looks at the kinks and looks at the weird floats and just like laughs and the leather daddies are obviously a joke. I just don't know if that's necessarily true. It might be for Pacino because he's into people who look like Jay. But if you're actually into like hot, hairy, fat men who like wear a lot of leather and want to do dirty things to you, you probably look at the leather daddy float and you're like, yeah, that's what I've been thinking the whole time. You know, like it probably clicks in your head. If you're into furries and you just hadn't realized and then you see the furry float and like it's people into that, surely you're like, Oh shit, I can do that! I too can dress up like that and go fuck someone with like a horns. I don't know. So I just think it's weird and kind of nasty for him to be like, I find that the daddy's gross. There's no point of re like realization for anyone else there. I think that's better. But the next thing he says is it means that the conversation you have with your parents about coming out is all about sex. But the difference is like, it's kind of the same if you just make it about love. It's them interrogating you about whether you have a meaningful monogamous relationship with someone of the other sex. That can make people just as uncomfortable if they're not comfortable being emotionally close to people. It was going to be a shit conversation anyway, but we didn't think that pride, which was like one day or two days a year, was a thing that was driving that. We thought that people were generally like pretty sex obsessed, so we thought that was marginal. Um, next, so in substantive, why we think love is a shitty companion. Like, Pacino wanted to say the 1960s sexual liberation was driven by people talking about love. It was actually the fact that women could have sex with people who they weren't married to and in love with because they had the pill. It was the separation of sex and love that made that an important movement, and so that doesn't really make sense. But what we would say is that all of your harms kind of still apply because the acceptability of being in love and seeing people in love is sometimes contingent on whether or not the couple in love that you're looking at is hot. Like, all of those biases occur. We think that people who are traditionally attractive have more access to love and getting into monogamous relationships rather than, like, if you just have a sloppy hookup with someone when you were drunk, like, you know, that's probably more likely to happen if you're not traditionally attractive. I don't know. I thought sex was really accessible, like, in a way that love often wasn't. But the other thing is people who are alone and single or people who just don't have that, like, cute monogamous relationship that they can put on Instagram feel fucking awful on Valentine's Day. That's basically what you want to turn it into, right? Gay Valentine's Day, where you just walk around and you're really smug if you're in a couple, you just feel awful if you're not in a couple. I thought that was obviously going to be worse and much more depressing. We think it's much more fun and exciting to go to an event that's about possibility and about the future and about what could happen tonight and, you know, like, who could suck your dick today rather than something that was about, well, I haven't worked on a relationship for the previous three months and no one fucking loves me, so no, I don't want to go out today, Kathy. A family comes into your room and is like, you could get a BJ tonight. Kevin, I don't know why I said Kevin. Kevin's obviously going to be like, Kathy, that sounds like it could happen today. 
Whereas a loving monogamous relationship would take at least a previous week of groundwork to actualize on the day. I literally just think it would, like, attendance rates would go through the fucking floor. And it would just be these smug people, and, like, everyone in relationships is boring. They're just, like, holding hands and, like, singing, dancing, creep. Fuck that song, right? Like, that is such a garbage tune. I don't know, like, it's not in a homophobic way, but, like, I don't want to listen to it. that are untrue. It is untrue that gay sex is dirtier, is more disgusting, is more perverse, is more weird than straight sex is. And Mardi Gras, instead of dealing with those stereotypes or overturning those stereotypes or showing that these stereotypes about gay sex are untrue, has taken this opposite approach of showing the most radical elements of any community and kind of celebrating those elements. Those elements that aren't even, as Thomas tells you, inherently more queer, right? There's straight people who like leather, right? There's straight people who are furries. The important thing is that we don't put those elements on show. So what happens is they've taken this problem, which is that gay sexuality is seen as more deviant and done a, a, a parade about the deviant elements of that sexuality. That does not in any way lead people to embrace that sexuality. Three issues in this speech. The first is on representation. Firstly, they tell you that the reason to celebrate this kind of parade is because it is a representation of the sexualities of a lot of different types of people. There's a few responses. The first is that all of these groups can still attend Mardi Gras, but also that things are going to get even better. Because we think sexualization should be viewed as a barrier to entry for groups that don't see themselves as largely sexualized, groups that have been harmed by over-sexualization or find that sexualization oppresses them and they are no longer able to enter, or even people who are younger or people who don't want to be associated with that kind of event. That is for the same reason that you might be ashamed to talk to your parents about sex. So you going to Mardi Gras as something that's fun where you dance and there's music is much easier than something which is an event where your parents know that you fuck afterwards. That is much harder to say. We think that it also distracts from the queerness of Mardi Gras because we think that pride is the element. So like this idea of gay Valentine's Day focus too much on the Valentine's Day element and not on like the literal pride element, which is would be the opposite. It wouldn't be about loving fucking love for the sake of it, but because you're proud to be gay, you're proud to be LGBT, and that those elements get distracted. Queerness is not a fetish, and, ele and sexualization focuses too much on fetish elements of people's sexualities. So, so what they then say is, well, then you're representing love, and love's fucking sad. True, but importantly, <laughs> we never said a boring counterfactual. We don't feel like it, you can only go in a couple. We think that what you're celebrating is queerness as separate from sexuality. We said that that was likely to be to do with things like love. But importantly, we think the key word to keep in your mind is pride, and that is what it's going to be centered around. It's not about, oh, and when you hear things like, oh, you could get a blowjob tonight, you could go out and get your dicks up tonight, just think about how exclusionary that is for people. How, like, how fucking upper class and young and liberal that shit is. Like, that is, like, the, like, the most university shit I've ever heard. Next. Uh, so Lex, what they're like is, at least you're representing women's sexuality. But importantly, we think queerness in the elements of pride and love is about you being the subject of that, whereas we think sexuality is much more likely to lead into you being the object. That's why women's sexuality is marginalised when parades are over-sexualised, because they can be viewed through the male gaze, but not just the male gaze, just any gaze, in the sense that it subjectifies you, or it objectifies you, and you're just like, maybe you don't want to get your tits out, because you live in a sexist society and you shouldn't have to, so fuck it. Lastly, they're like, well, this is the only place to have 
good representation of sexuality. For example, Grindr is racist, but you have to think to yourself, the fact that Grindr is racist, the fact that ARC and all the other gay um, clubs can be racist, shows you that the sexual culture of some elements of LGBT community is racist. And for that reason, it is that sexual culture that is something that shouldn't be put on its forefront. Yeah. But it is the inclusive pride community element that should be put on the forefront. If Grindr is, is racist, why would we make it that the Grindr parts of being gay are the ones that come at the forefront? So lastly, in terms of representation, we think that this means that some people literally can't attend. So the fact that you might know that you're gay from like primary school, or you might want to have the, like allow your kids to explore that from day dot, but you cannot take them to this kind of event. And at that point, the representation is nil when you can't even see anything, good or bad representation, if it is not seen by nine, 10, 11 or 12 year old, is as if the parade never even happened. So representation, much better under our side of the house. Next, how should we respond to the stigmatization of sex? I'm gonna have a whole issue on how we should respond to the stigmatization of sex. The first thing I wanna say is that the most of the stereotypes that we hear about gay sex are untrue, but you would not know that looking at Mardi Gras parades. And we think that this in fact continues them and they've not shown a path besides reclamation of these ideas, ideas that people, they have not given a reason why they would want to reclaim them or why that would be a politically empowering choice. To the extent that it is a trade-off for conservatives, you should note that lots of people kind of have, are a little bit conservative at heart and maybe don't want to have to be a fucking furry dude. Um, so essentially, this is, um, it's like, to the extent that it destigmatizes gay sex, it's important to note, like, you don't see things like actual anal happening at, at, at at, at Pride, you don't get to see any sex. To the extent that it's sexualized and dirty is that it is showing a lot of like the grottier elements of having a, sexual, a sexuality and a life and that you like embracing the dirtiness of it, which is totally unnecessary and has nothing to do with, with um, desexual, like with destigmatizing anal sex itself. So to the extent that it seems like this sex or the sex acts are going to be perverting to your child, there's no reason why that would change after watching Pride. They say, well, it counteracts all of the narratives that tell you you should repress your sexuality, but it doesn't, but the, re the reality is the opposite, which is that it kind of tells you that your sexuality isn't right in the sense that it doesn't align with that, or it makes you question it to the extent that you don't fit in with that, and it makes you want to repress it because you have a fear that if you were to embrace it, you are gonna become one of those people who you don't respect or who you think are outside of society. Lastly, it does pressure you into sex to the extent that one narrative might cause you to, to like repress yourself. We don't think it's a, a good thing to have a narrative that pressures you into having sex ever. And for that reason, we think that it's not subversive in that sense. Uh, and lastly, that the, it is not true that, well, sex is the last frontier, because we think firstly, every generation has to re-explain to their parents, re-explain to their loved ones that love is love. And that hurdle is one that is constantly being re-jumped. And it is not something that is being overcome in a vast number of communities. Maybe we're lucky here uh, in Newtown in Sydney, but pride is a global phenomenon. And it's also a, a hurdle that in the most least privileged communities is yet to be jumped. And for that reason, we think that it is the first step, but it's also like kind of the last step in the sense that we don't think you need your parents to accept your sex life that much. Um, maybe it's better that they don't talk to you about it ever. Um, next, lastly, on political capital, they say, well, this political capital point is moot because some politicians uh, um, love Mardi Gras, which is not true because we had a lot more analysis to the point. For example, that it, it, um, it reinforces ingrained homophobia in society, which makes people more likely to vote in homophobic ways, more likely to vote in homophobic politicians, less likely to vote for safe schools, for example, because they think that it has something to do with teaching their ch children fetishistic sex, rather than realizing that that it's actually about people's identities, their pride, and their love for each other. And importantly, those who are most marginalized are the ones who engage exclusively with Mardi Gras as their only representation of gay people. So to that extent, the idea that this is just one day of the year, how much harm can it do? Well, that much harm. Mardi Gras can still be fun, it can still be a party, it can still be about pride, but it shouldn't have to be about sexuality that's non-representative and stigmatizing. Thanks.
There are three issues in the, ba in the debate. The first, is this too soon? Second, do we get acceptance? Thirdly, do we get representation? The first, affirmative, uh, sorry, negative tells you at first speaker that Mardi Gras should be a platform for people who have been forced to keep the sexualization to themselves, who have been criminalized for publicly embracing that sexualization. And to reclaim this is deeply, personally meaningful to these people. Negative never gives any response as to why, because of the fact that uniquely the state has criminalized and imprisoned people for doing sexual acts. They should not be able to reclaim it in this way, and that's not empowering to those people. Secondly, at first negative, they tell you that queer women have the sexual element of their identity co-opted by straight men, and to reclaim that sexuality from the people who stole it from them is personally meaningful to those people. And this is a completely unique public platform in that for the kinds of events that they wanted to say that would include young people as young as primary school by third affirmative, uh, those other events can exist, they uh, can exist in this world. We tell you you can only reclaim sex through sexualization and sexy events. You do that under our side of the house, Mardi Gras was the only way to do it. That is why affirmative wins the principle in this debate which got no response. Secondly, do we get acceptance? Their argument is self-defeating because they tell us from first that the most conservative people in the world would be totally fine with their children as young as 12 attending their event, which means they cannot then claim that they're pushing for acceptance of anything at all, which is currently not accepted in the community, which makes it unclear what they would achieve in this debate. They don't challenge anything, they lose the protest element of Mardi Gras, and maybe get more people to attend an event which only reinforces the social narratives which are already dominant in society. They don't get something which tells them they can embrace their sexuality. They don't get something which tells them a counter to the things that their parents are telling them because their own analysis is that they want an event with those parents who are the most conservative, the most religious, the most likely to be homophobic, to be totally fine with. They got an event that did nothing for anyone, even if more people went there. The last thing I'm going to deal with is representation. Here is where they lose the debate by the clearest margin. Negative tells us people who are diverse can still go. They just can't possibly embrace their sexuality or sexualize themselves or reclaim their sexuality in that context. We tell them, we tell you down the bench that the only alternatives for them to possibly do that are places like Ark and Grindr, which are currently racist. They tell you to this that if those platforms are racist, it just means gay people are racist. That was not true in this debate. What was true in this debate is what we tell you at Lucy. Things like gay porn, things like the structure of those apps which enable you to set preferences for, re for race mean that those racist uh, narratives are reinforced within that community. We tell you right from first negative that the only way to respond to that particular form of exclusion is to have an event which is uniquely diverse in that it hands out equal plots of land along an equally length parade to people who are diverse, who cannot normally sexualize themselves in that context, to be able to engage with their own sexuality in a way that engages with the sexy parts of it that they would otherwise be denied entirely. We'd secondly tell you that this is effective at normalizing the sexual experiences of those people because you intermingle the idea of gay sex with party and you make it corporately and politically stamped as being something which is acceptable. Their pushback on this is that no, because you don't show anal sex and you only show furries. That ignored the fact that that is not how Mardi Gras is perceived. It's not perceived as something which only caters to people who like to have sex dressed as animals. It's something that, that panders to the fact that the young gay people who are there and who are covered in glitter will have sex later on that day and are currently cooking up in front of everyone. And that's something that is supported by the highest echelons of our society, by the corporations, by the politicians, by the conservative leaders. They got literally nothing in this debate. So even if we didn't get what we shot for, we still won. The refrain of the negative is essentially, we have acceptance of love, and now we should, should have shot for acceptance of sex. And, but what we told you, crucially, was that we did not have acceptance of love for many, many people, and that the pushing towards sexualization of pride was actively harmful for the most basic form of acceptance that we needed. 
Two issues in this speech, the first on flight of protest, the second on individual queer people. And the first question asked here on flight of protest is what exactly should it be protesting for? And as I told you in my introduction, the claim of the negative is we should deal with love, so we should deal with other things now. We pointed out three things. Firstly, that massively oversold the extent to which that acceptance had been gotten, that pride was a movement fighting on many fronts that still needed basic elements. Two, that that was a problem that reset every generation and that constantly individual people needed pride to encourage them and tell them they could come out to their parents before talking about sex. And that thirdly, you could get acceptance of sex through the acceptance of love foremost and you did not re need to redirect them movement to achieve that. The other important claim there as well, women particularly need an acceptance of sex for, uh, for queer women, but we told you in third is that you needed an acceptance of love foremost, that women were sexualized anyway, and you needed a way in which to achieve acceptance of queer, loving female relationships. And the important thing to note here is, even if they succeed there and prove that love is less of a worthy goal than sex, what I'm going to tell you now is that you get a far less capacity to uh, fulfill that goal. So even if it's slightly less important, they fulfill theirs to a far less uh, extent. What do we tell you here uh, under what works? We tell you this is actively harmful in a number of ways, that it legitimizes awful narratives about queerness, where this is often the only point of access for people, of grittiness, of depravity, of otherization, and that does change the views of people against that, not just reinforce the views of people who are already homophobic as they try and tell you a negative reply. Their, their push is then threefold. The first is we should not shoot for appeasement because it is the moral. We tell you at second that unfortunately it is a reality and it's perhaps regrettable that element, but it's not regrettable that we should still try and appease people and fight for acceptance. Second, that people won't go because now it will be boring. We tell you that we are not standing for boring events and the contention at third negative that this is no longer queer is obviously untrue because it is a pride event celebrating queer pride. The third thing is that then, that, well, you know, you're never changing anyway, but it's about a worsening of those ideas, not a necessarily changing it, which is why you're actively harmful for the acceptance or the legitimacy of pride and protest. And this is a seriously powerful argument because it is about real and tangible outcomes on large scales and tangible outcomes for those who are the most vulnerable, who, are, who we should care about the most in this debate, for those in conservative or religious communities. Even if they are not all permitted to go, their parents do not view their sexuality as depraved. The second issue now is on individual queer people. And under, under representation here, the contention from the negative is, this represents people in the queer movement who are otherwise not. We point out two very quick, clear things. The first is, even if this is a better way of expressing the person and representation, the manner of representation is actively harmful because it is sexualization to the nth degree and there were clear incentives to do so pointed to down the bench, means that even if you are sexualizing people who are otherwise not, the way in which they are forced to or coerced to represent that sexualization is a harm and not a benefit for the negative. And that secondly, it, the queer movement is still just as likely to mirror many of those other forms of discrimination in pride as they were in other spaces or in other instances, and they never successfully deviated that. The other push is, well, maybe you're up, you're then just having, you know, other poor and unrepresentative, unrepresentatives on your side, which I've preempt in my speech telling you that sex specifically also buys into beauty and sex norms that are worse. But even if you don't buy representation of people, we tell you there are harmful norms that come from the coercion of sex that either shames people or coerces them into sex they are not needing. And their arguments about, uh, you know, protest movements misunderstand that is about coming from pride, telling you that to be queer is to do that. And that was powerful and that was harmful. Uh, proud to have